recorder is on, the mic is good, and we are going to continue from where we left off last Wednesday. Yeah, that was a week ago. <laughs> so I, ho I hope you guys got a chance to really kind of review the material that we have talked about so far and also read ahead a little bit, at least, you know, including today's topic, which is uh, I added I added a new more a new okay I added a new module. It's called symbols, definitions, rigor, and precision. Um, you know, it's not you know related to 440 directly, but I think it relates to all STEM classes. Uh, basically, it talks about you know why it is important to understand the symbols because you know that is going to be one of the things that some people may find challenging in this class is there are a lot of symbols and I make use of those symbols a lot too, okay? But there's a reason why that is the case. So reading this module may be helpful, okay? You know, because you know, if you want a st strategy to kind of practice and read the material and then get you know, a better understanding of the symbols, that might be helpful. Um, so that's up to you. All right, so we're getting back to set notations and there are a few more operators that I need to talk about. So we are still getting back to the basic you know, set notations. And then the next topic, which I hope we can kind of finish today is basic quantifiers. And then after that, you know, after today, we can, uh, I can unlock the set notation um, homework assignment. So it's not yet available because it depends on how much material I can you know, go over today. All right, so do we have any questions from last Wednesday? No questions. Is that because you got you guys got everything, or is it because you completely forgot what we talked about last Wednesday? Yes. I have a question. Yes, uh, go ahead. Uh, let's say for that class you were in class for the elementary class. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this one over here is an element of the set here, which has no particular name. That particular set is an element of X. Okay. Yeah, so you, you look at it like, uh, like folders, right? So X is a folder, and it has two files, A and B, but it also has a subfolder. In this case, it's anonymous. It has no name, but that subfolder has one, two, and three. So one technically is not a file under X. It is a file in a subfolder of X. That is correct. One is not an element of X in this case. Yes? Um, why is it one, two, nine? It can go in a different... You mean the um, uh, exercises? Yeah, number 10. Number 10. All right. So we can... We haven't really talked about subset oh. and proper subset yet, so maybe wait until I cover that material. Um, we have covered um, basic concepts of set, you know, elements, Equivalence set as an element of another set, uh, set a set that has infinite number, an infinite number of elements, the empty set, and we have not talked about. I think we talked about intersection and union as well as and also difference, but we haven't talked about subsets yet. So that's kind of one of the things that we'll talk about today. And we also haven't talked about Cartesian product, which looks like a multiplication. It is a form of multiplication if you think about it. Um, so let's take a look at this notation here. The Cartesian product, which is represented by the cross you know, symbol of A and B, and both of those are sets, consists of elements. Each element looks like this, okay? You know, X, Y in parentheses. It is called a two tuple. So when, when I mention the word tuple, you can think array. Okay, or vector, okay, depending on you know, which programming language background you come from. But basically, anything that is in parentheses is basically a tuple. A tuple means it is just an array where ordering is important and both items can have the same value. So it's not a set. Yes? Is this tuple the same tuple in Python? I do not know about Python tuples. Um, 
Oh, okay. Um, well, you know, whether it's immutable or not, you know, it's not of concern in our discussion. So all we need to know is in this particular tuple, there are two things, x and y. The order has to be x, y, so ordering does matter. And both x, y can, can have exactly the same value. So a tuple is definitely not a set. Okay, so it's important to differentiate in a tuple from a set. So every element in this particular uh, outcome or in the Cartesian product is a two tuple. The two you know, basically refers to how many elements, how many components do we have in the tuple. And then the vertical bar is more or less, you know, um, it's an element if and only if the following condition is true. So what do we need to be true? X has to be an element of A, Y has to be an element of B. Okay. So now we want to look at some examples. Okay, so we'll go ahead and take a look at some examples. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think of the best way to give you guys examples. Do you want me to use the tablet you know, where I use handwriting, or do you want me to try to use Joplin? So it's formatted in Markdown on one side, and it's going to be displayed properly on the other side. I can do either one. I got both set up, so you can you can you guys can choose. Markdown. Markdown. So Joplin. Okay. Yeah, Joplin is the tool to use Markdown. So let me go ahead and start up Joplin. Yeah, my my version is not even the latest, but you know it works. There we go. So uh, have I shown you guys how to use Joplin before in this particular class? A little? Okay. So I'm going to continue with, um, I can make a new one. So let's go ahead and make a new one. And I just name it for after this today's date, 2024-0904. All right. So this is an example, okay? I want you guys to tell me what is in the Cartesian product in this case. So I want A to consist of the elements. We'll, we'll go simple because otherwise I would just have a lot of elements you know, in the Cartesian product. So in this case, I will have one, two in A. And then B has, um, let's say AB. And now I, my question is, what about a Cartesian product with B? What does it, what does it have? Okay. So what do you, what do you think? Give me one example of an element. Now we know the format of each element of the Cartesian product it's going to be a two tuple, okay? So that much we know already. So that means you know, we're going to say, okay, every element is going to look like this, in parentheses with a comma. Yes. One a would be one. Yes. So one a, but it has to be one a. It cannot be a one, because as a tuple, one a and a one are two distinct tuples. One belongs to the Cartesian product. The other one does not. Okay. Hmm? Um, the ordering is important in the tuple. So 1A versus A1 are two different tuples. All right. So um, what about uh, another one? Give me another example. 1, comma B. Okay. 2, comma A. And then 2, comma B. Yep. That is correct. So that is the Cartesian product of A and B completely spelled out. So do we have any questions about the concept of a Cartesian product? It really is like multiplication, because if you think about it, the number of elements of A and the number of elements of B versus the number of elements in the Cartesian product between A and B, the, the number of elements in the Cartesian product is in fact the product of the number of elements in A and the number of elements in B. So in that sense, it really is multiplication. So are we okay with this concept? Yes, go ahead. Is one set of, wait, no, no, it's like the 
Okay. Now, A and B do not have to be different. They can be the same if that is how it's supposed to work out. So there's no problem with something like this. So this one, I, I'm not going to bother with naming of the set here. So I just have you know, one, two as a set, um, multiplied or Cartesian product with um, one, two by itself. So in this case, okay, I'm gonna close the equation first. So what are we gonna get? Okay, I'm gonna go with a somewhat of a random order here. <laughs> just to emphasize that in a set, the order does not matter, but in a tuple, the matter, the order does matter. Is that okay? Does everybody get the point that I'm trying to make? Because I know most people are thinking, oh, we should go for one, 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 two, two, one, and then two, two. No, there's no particular way that we should order how we list the items inside a set because there's no intrinsic ordering of elements in a set. However, when, we, when it comes to a tuple, then the ordering is important. This is also an example to show you that you know, in a tuple, the same value can appear multiple times because you can see how you know, two, two, you know, that's a tuple, you know, and we can have two you know, basically appearing twice because it is position sensitive. And one, two, and two, one are definitely not considered to be the same, even though they look the same, but they're not. So are we okay so far? Just think of a two tuple as an array with two elements. I think that's probably the best way to look at it. So some people would say that they have many one ones and one ones. Hmm? Do you think that just because does that matter? Uh, can you ask the question can you again? Say that in an array you have both ones and ones and they're all one one times one and then you can't say that You cannot have one one times one one because in a set you cannot have duplicate elements. Right, but essentially you have two sets, right? Just like <laughs> okay, so let me, yeah, go ahead. So if you were presenting this uh, product to the data set? Um, then it would be the same as you know, handling the first one first and then take the result of the first one and then Cartesian product it with the third one. Okay. So, you know, but that's a good question because you know, then do we end up with a tuple that has another tuple in it? Or do we flatten the tuple so that you know, we just have the elements kind of laid out flat? So the answer to that question, we'll talk about it later because you know, it depends on the context. Sometimes having that structure is actually important, but most of the time we don't care about the structure, we just flatten the whole thing when we perform a Cartesian, pro Cartesian product. All right, any other questions? Let me show you a, a tricky one, okay? So this time I will give you this example. So I have a set that has three items in it. Okay, so one, two, and three, and this is supposed to be closed curly brace times the empty set. So the question is, what is the answer to this question? Hmm? Just the empty set, very good, okay. The answer is just the empty set because the requirement of a Cartesian product is of the two tuple, one element has to come from the set on the left-hand side, and the other element has to come from the set on the right-hand side. Well, since one of them is an empty set, nothing can be coming from the empty set. And as a result, we cannot formulate any two tuples in this case. Very good, all right. Any other questions about you know, Cartesian products? We, we are gonna use Cartesian products quite a bit in this class. When we talk about functions, relations, um, and also cardinality, all of, no, you know, all of those modules depend on you know, tuples, so, or Cartesian products. So it's a very you know, important concept in this class. I guess when we get to those concepts, you know, we can, we'll see whether there are some questions. So that works too. So are we good so far? Okay, all right. So we're gonna move on and talk about some additional concepts. So now we are gonna move on to the concept of a subset of, okay? Which is basically what this symbol is representing. It is, in this case, we say that A is a subset of B. But A is a subset of B is a statement. It can be true or false. It is a, it's a Boolean expression. So now we can say A is a subset of B if and only if 
A minus B, or the difference between A and B is an empty set, and A intersecting with B is just A. All right, so what does that mean? Let's go ahead and look at some examples, okay? Then you get an idea of, you know, uh, what does it mean when we say A is a subset of B. So once again, I'm gonna give you examples in Joplin. So it looks like your Joplin is working out okay. Okay. All right, so we are gonna take a look at um, how we define A and how we define B. And then we'll take a look at A is a subset of B and see whether that's true or not. And what I'll do is I'm gonna copy and paste it a few times because I'm just gonna copy the format. In this case, let's look at A having an element. Oh, let's let's do a fun one. Let's A let A be an empty set and B has A, B, and C in it. So the question is, uh, is A a subset of B? All right. So if you're thinking, okay, this doesn't make sense, okay, then we go back to the expression and then we evaluate the expression and see what, you know, what the expression is, is gonna give us. So getting back here, A is an empty set, B has A, B, and C, so the question is A minus B, does that equal to the empty set? Yes, okay, and if I use an intersection between A and B, do I just get A back? A is an empty set, B has A, B, and C in it. What is common between the two? Nothing, right? So nothing means you know, it is an empty set, so we get A back. So that means the conjunction is true. So that means in this case, if A is an empty set and B has A, A B, and C in it, the empty set is indeed a subset of B, which has elements A, B, and C. Is that okay? Are we good? All right. So let me ask you another one, which is kind of like a extension of this one. It is exactly as it is rendered here. Okay, so I'm just gonna highlight the portion. It's exactly as it is rendered here. A is an empty set. B is also an empty set. Is an empty set a subset of an empty set? It is, okay, very good. Because if we go back to how we define an empty set, this is an empty set, this is also an, em an empty set. What is in an empty set that is not in an empty set? Nothing, right? So we get the empty set back. And if I look at the intersection, what is common to an empty set and, a, and an empty set? Nothing. So we get the empty set back too. So now if we get true and true again, which means you know, an empty set is a subset of an empty set, is in fact true. So these are what we call the boundary conditions because we're pushing it to the point where, oh, we, we cannot get a, a set that is smaller than an empty set. So we are testing you know, the uh, definitions here against you know, what we call boundary conditions. It's always good to identify boundary conditions because you know, that means you're looking for the extreme cases and try to figure out you know, how the definition works for the extreme cases. All right, let's work out you know, some more, you know, in, you know, not so interesting cases. I would call these, you know, kind of more mundane cases. So let's call, you know, let's have A being A one, two, and three, and then we'll have B being uh, two, three, and four. There we go. So now the question is, okay, let me minimize some of these windows. Okay, that shows better. So we are looking at the third line here. A has one, two, and three. B has two, three, and four. Is A a subset of B? It is not, okay, but because even if you look at the definition here, um, if you look at A minus B, what is that? A has one, two, three. B has two, three, four. So what is A minus B? It's just one, a set with one as an element. Well, that is not an empty set. So that means you know, we don't even have to look at the other one. We already know that A is not a subset of B in this case. Are we good so far? Okay. So the last you know, uh, interesting case is what if 
A is 1, 2, and 3, and B is also just 1, 2, and 3. So 1, 2, 3, and then B is also 1, 2, and 3. The question is, is a set a subset of itself? And neither of these, th this is not an empty set. It is, very good. Because if we go back to how it is defined here, A minus B, because you know, they are both the same, so we end up with an empty set. Um, when you, because A and B are really the same, so the intersection would also be just the same. So you know, it, it would also meet this requirement. So we have a set is always a subset of itself. It doesn't matter what it is, okay? It can be the empty set, it can have a bazillion your know, items, it does not matter. So we good so far with the definition of a subset of. Okay, all right. So now we move on to a proper subset of. So in this case, you know, the keyword here is proper, okay? So we define A as a proper subset of B, if and only if, a is already a subset of B, and B minus A is not empty. In other words, there is something in B that is not in A. So that's the only difference. So in order, if A is a proper subset of B, it, it is automatically A subset of B as well, but not the other way around. If A is a subset of B, it does not guarantee that A is a proper subset of B. Is that concept okay? All right, cool. All right, so now we are ready for uh, the, the last operator. The last operator is, it doesn't seem important, but it really is, okay? So many times we are interested in the number of elements in the set X. The notation bar X bar is called the cardinality of X, which is essentially the number of elements in X. For example, the cardinality of a set that has two, four, six, eight as elements is gonna be four. So it sounds really simple, right? But then later on, I would say in about two weeks or so, we're gonna talk about the cardinality of the set of all natural numbers. You go like, that's infinite. There's an infinite number of natural numbers. And then we're gonna look at the set of all integers, which is also infinite, right? Because there, there's an infinite number of integers. Now, the interesting thing is we can actually establish the quote-unquote equivalent of cardinality between the, uh, the set of all natural numbers and the set of all integers. It does not make sense at all, right? Because one is a proper subset of the other one, because every natural number is an integer, but not the other way around. So the set of all natural numbers is a proper subset of the set of all integers. But yet, when we look at the cardinality, we claim that they are the same. How can we do this? You cannot even compare infinity to infinity. You know, if you ask any math professor and you ask, is infinity the same as infinity? The math professor would go like, you cannot compare infinity to infinity. It's not a, qu it, it's not a quantity to be compared. So how can we establish the cardinality of a set that has an infinite number of elements to say that it is equivalent to the cardinality of another set that also has an infinite number of elements in it. So we're gonna address that after a while, okay? Because we have to first introduce uh, functions and then we'll get to um, Aleph Node. Okay, that module is called Aleph Node. I have not converted that into GitHub yet, you know, so it's something that I need to do when we get there. All right, so there was a question about number 10, okay, subset and proper subset. So this is the question. Explain the difference between a subset and a proper subset. Provide an example of a set E and a subset F where F is a proper subset of E. Okay, so we can, so F is a proper subset of E. Okay, got it. All right, so we'll go ahead and use this template, except now we have set E and set F. And if I want F to be a proper subset of A, I just have to go like, let's take out at least one item in F. Then in that case, I can now say that A is a proper subset of B. Because um, 
excuse me, take, I take it back. F is a subset, is a proper subset of E because one is only found in E but not in F. So does that answer the question? Because there was a question earlier about this one. Is that, does it address the question? Okay. All right, very good. Oh, A, B, you know, I need oh, to change that. Let me, let me fix this first because, you know, we are, we are supposed to be referencing, I think, E in this case. Go ahead. What if B ha only has one and two? If A has A and B. Oh, okay. Then the result would not be the same because everything is flipped backwards. So you're basically asking, let me make a copy of this. One, two, three, okay. So you're basically asking, what if we do this, right? Well, in that case, you know, because the first element of a two tuple has to come from the left hand side, that means you know, we end up with A1. B1, oops, yeah, go ahead. Uh, what if you have one, two, one, A? The same thing. So if you keep the same definition here mm -hmm. and you reverse you know, the order here, then you end up with the same. But I made a mistake somewhere. It doesn't like, uh, hmm? Oh, I forgot the backslash. There we go. So you're basically asking what if we keep A and B defined this way, but in the Cartesian product we do a B times A, then the outcome would still be the same as this okay. set here, okay. um, which I forgot to want change the last one. This is a B, uh, let's see, A1, B1, A2, B2, there we go. Is that okay? So let me use a bar here to kind of separate the two test cases, you know, because I, don't, I want to make sure that we understand that these are two different test cases. And you can see how easy it is to use um, HTML in Markdown, you know, where normally you have to say what, HR, horizontal rule, you know, ruler. Um, you know, in um, Markdown, it's just the you know, three minuses. All right. Any other questions of all the set operators? Yes. Um, you mean here? If you can, the order of the elements in a set does not matter. So that means you know, the way you list a, a, you can put A2 all the way at the beginning and A1 all the way to the end and then switch B1, B2. It doesn't matter as long as, because all we care when we talk about a set is whether something is an element or not. How it is relative to all the other elements, we do not care. All right, any questions? questions all right so we're going to move into something that is even more obscure but it is a necessary thing to for us to talk about not only in this class but also in programming in general it is a very important notion it has to do with quantifiers so this is our next module it's called quantifiers it's not really particularly difficult as long as you already know how to use the word every as opposed to the word of or the phrase of at least one. Okay? So how many of you think that, yeah, I think I know when to use the word every and when to use the phrase of at least one? Well, then you already got the concept down. Okay? You, it, what is left is really just the symbols. So what we'll do is we'll start from the beginning. 
quantifiers implicitly apply to everything or nothing in the universe. In other words, when we use the word every, it means everything in the entire universe. Okay, you, me, the classroom, the building, Earth as a whole, the sun, the solar system, the other galaxies, and so on. Everything. So you go like, we, we, we usually do not need to use every that applies to everything in the entire universe, right? We usually want to say every, every professor at ARC, right? Or every CIS professor at ARC. We want to kind of restrict that quantifier to only a certain set of items. Okay, so we'll talk about that in just a little bit. So we'll use the variable x to refer to the thing that we're examining, and p of x is a predicate, <coughs> is a predicate. A predicate is a fancy name of a function that returns Boolean. We talked about this already. Okay, so this is not new to us. This is a second exposure of the concept of a predicate. So when to say that everything in the universe makes p of x true, we use the following notation. So this looks like an a that is upside down. It is for all, okay? So all you have to do is to remember all. A-L-L -L starts with A, right? So for all of x, for all x, p of x is true. But this entire thing, the quantified expression itself, can be true or false, depending on how you define p of x. Is that okay? In other words, quantifiers are applied to statements and by itself, the quantified statement can be true or false. I'm not claiming that everything you know, makes P of X true. I'm asking, is it true that everything makes P of X true? That is the most important part is I'm asking a question. By default, it is a question. Um, and then there's also the exist existential quantifier. So this one is called the universal quantifier. For all, it's universal. This is there exists, which is the same thing as at least one, okay? So if you don't like the term yeah, there exists, it is the same thing as at least one. So in this case, we are basically saying at least one thing in the entire universe makes P of X true. And it is also a statement. In other words, it can be true or false. Okay, it is entirely possible that nothing in the entire universe makes P of X true, but this is an expression. It can be either true or false. Are we okay so far with the existential quantifier, which is this one, which is also the same as at least one, or in normal language, some, S-O-M-E, is actually the same thing as there exists. This one here is for all, but in everyday language, it's just every. You can also, you know, sometimes we just say all, okay? So are we good so far in terms of the context of what quantifiers are? Now, does it really matter in a normal way whether you use at least one or some versus every? Okay, uh, let's consider this statement. I'm not saying the statement is true or not, okay? You can evaluate the statement based on your own standard. So I'm gonna say, Every CIS professor at ARC sucks. That's a statement, okay? But is that statement different from at least one professor at ARC, at, at least one CIS professor at ARC sucks? Are those two different questions or are they really asking the same thing? Different. They're different questions, right? So let's just say that I'm the only professor at ARC, CIS, that sucks. That will make at least one professor, at least one CIS professor at ARC suck. That would be true. But since Iraj does not suck, okay, Damon, which has who has retired, does not suck, uh, Kakasan, who has not retired, does not suck, and so on, then the statement of every ARC CIS professor sucks would be false. So that means the two questions are different. Is that okay? All right, so I just want to give you examples to illustrate why these two quantifiers are different. Now, are they related? Yes, they are actually related in a very strange way. They are related in the same way as and versus or. The for all 
It's kind of like a huge, gigantic ant. But there exists. It's almost like a gigantic, you know, or. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about that later. Okay. So now we were going to include the use of negation, which is the cliff symbol. So now we look at this statement here and ask, what does it mean? Well, this means it is not the case that at least one thing in the entire universe makes P of X true. Okay, let's examine that statement again. It is not the case that at least one element makes P of X true. So now you have to ask the question, isn't it saying the same thing as everything in the universe makes, uh, evaluates P of X and the P of X is false? P of X is false for everything in the entire universe. That's one way to say it. The other way to say it is not a single thing in the entire universe makes P of X true. Are those two the same statement? They are indeed the same statement. So that means there's a really awkward way of converting a there exist into a for all. And you can see how the conversion is just taking the negation on the outside of the quantifier to the inside of whatever statement we are trying to quantify. This, by the way, is also, you know, uh, it relates to De Morgan's law, which we'll use quite a bit in this class, okay? This is actually because of De Morgan's law, which we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that in time. <laughs> But for those of you who absolutely cannot wait to talk you know, until we talk about De Morgan's Law, I'll give you De Morgan's Law here. Just so that you have multiple exposure, it's good to have different exposure to the same concept, just at, in different context. So De Morgan's Law says something like this. It says, you know, um, the negation of X and Y. Oh, I need to put a dollar sign in front of the whole thing. Go. So it says, you know, the negation of x and y is really the same thing as the negation of x or the negation of y. Okay. So you look at this and go like, oh, that looks kind of funky, right? You know, how can and or be quote unquote the same just by moving that negation from the outside of the operator to the things that the operator is operating. So it feels kind of awkward, okay? You know, in some cases you can say, okay, let me let me just kind of cross-check this and I'll make X and Y your know, actual statements to see whether that makes sense. That's one way to make sense out of this whole thing. The second way to make sense out of this entire thing is much easier. Use a truth table. <laughs> did I mention truth table? Yes, I did. In the very first class on Monday, last Monday, okay? So the way you do this, okay, to make sense, quote unquote, make sense out of this, is to make a truth table. So markdown is actually quite easy, okay, makes it quite easy to make a table. And it looks kind of like a table too. So, uh, so now we have uh, the first expression. I'm just gonna copy and paste here. Um, yank until we see plus. And then we do a paste here. I just used the VI key binding in uh, Joplin. So for those of you who like you know, VI key binding, you can actually use VI key binding in Joplin. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you might get to know VI after you transfer to a four-year university, depending on which university. If they use VS Code, you probably will never see VI or hear about VI ever again. On the other hand, if they just give you a Linux your command line shell and go like, do everything in the command line, then you probably will learn the VI. But knowing VI is gonna help you in some other ways too, because I think, you know, in industry, I think some people actually value knowing VI, but you know, that's just my opinion. The easiest way to start a war in industry is to say, I think VI is better than Emacs. Emacs is another plain text editor used a lot in industry. And basically, once you claim one is better than the other one, you have just started a holy war. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. you know, people have a very strong opinion of, my text editor is much better than yours. 
And then the, the VS Code people comes into the room, they go like, VS Code. <laughs> you will start to see those people when you transfer to a four-year university, and when you go out to work, you will also start to see people like that too. All right, so we are making a truth table. X can be false, and when X is false, Y can be false. When both are false, um, the negation of X and Y is true, and the disjunction of not X, not Y is also going to be true in this case. The next row is when X is false, Y is true, and in this case, let's see. So X and Y is going to be false. The negation of that is going to be true. And on the other side, we only need one of the negation of X or the negation of Y to be true for the, for the disjunction to be true. And since X is false, so the negation of X is true, so we automatically has, have a true here. And then the, um, this is a mirror image. And since the operator or is commutative, so that means you know, we don't have to really work this one out. We just say, eh, X or Y and Y or X are the same. We dealt with that already. And then the last one is when both are true. Okay, When both X and Y are true, X and Y itself is true, but the negation of that is going to be false. And then since you know, X and Y are both true, so that means not X is false, not Y is also false, false or false is indeed false. So there you go, okay, a truth table. Clearly you know, demonstrate that De Morgan's law is correct, it works. Now De Morgan's law is a pair, okay? You can also go the other way around. So I'm gonna talk about this just a little bit more and then we'll switch back to the regularly scheduled program. So if I were to flip the operator to an or on this side and then flip this one to an and on this side, it is still true. This is the other one, the other rule of De Morgan's law. So De Morgan's law has two components. Both of these are referring to De Morgan's law. Obviously, the truth table will be different in this case, but it doesn't mean that you know, it does not apply. So one exercise for you guys to do is to make another truth table similar to this one, but applying to this equality of De Morgan's law. So that will give you some practice of using De Morgan's Law and the truth table. And I think by the time we have to make use of De Morgan's Law, then you'll go like, yeah, we got, I know how to do it. All right, so are we good so far? I kind of digressed a little bit to talk about De Morgan's Law. But the reason why I digressed was because this, converting into this, is basically because of De Morgan's Law. And likewise, if you say it is not the case that everything in the entire universe makes P of X true, it is the same thing as saying there is at least one thing in the entire universe that makes P of X false. Okay, that, that's kind of the counterparts of these two. Once again, one is, the de one is one version of the De Morgan's Law, the other one is the other one. All right. So now we are filtering, we are talking about filtering. In other words, it doesn't really make sense in mathematics or computer science that we talk about everything in the entire universe. Okay, I was about to say everything under the sun, but it's actually more than that, right? Because you know, it's everything, everything in the entire universe. The sun is just one of the stars in the, the, in the Milky Way, and the Milky Way is one of many, many, many galaxies in the entire universe. So. It's not just under the sun, everything in the universe. So most of the time we want to restrict and say, we just want to talk about these things over here, okay? So the way we do that, if, if the elements of X is the only things that you want, you're concerned about, and you want to use the uh, universal quantifier, this is how we can restrict and say, we only apply P of E when E is an element of X. For everything else in the entire universe, we don't care, okay? So let's check out how this works, okay? So I will construct a case, okay? And so that you can tell me you know, whether that works or not. My watch is buzzing me, it's time to take a roll, so we're gonna take a short break from the material and we'll just go ahead and take a roll right now.
I'm making this visible. It is right after basic quantifiers and before big operators. The access code is, not surprisingly, for all. All, one word, all lowercase. I can write it on the whiteboard. Walking a little funny today because I have gout on my left foot. <laughs> so that makes it a little discomfort, a little uncomfortable. So I'm going to switch back to the slide, okay, to the quantifier slide because the access code is on the whiteboard, you know, if you need a little bit more time. <coughs> Are we good so far? How many people need more time for taking role? No one? Okay, all right. So we'll, we'll use this as an example. Uh, for everything E, for everything in the entire universe, that thing is an element of one, two, three, implies that thing is less than five. That is basically what this entire statement is saying. So I'm saying that functionally, this entire thing is the same thing as saying, Okay, let's make a conjunction of all the less than five and we apply that to every element in this particular set, which, is, which has one, two, and three in it. The actual value of the quantified expression is not of concern to me. The question is, what about tax car? Is it less than five? Do we care? So, what is going on here? Because the quantifier that is outside of the parentheses is still applicable to everything in the universe, including my car, okay? The question is, my I okay, first of all, is my car an element of one, two, three? It is not. So in the case of an implication, what happens to the value of the implication when the left-hand side is false to begin with. The whole thing is true, that's right. So that means, you know, yeah, there are actually a lot of implicit and blah, 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 and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. So when the element being concerned, okay, the, when the element in the entire universe that we're concerned about is my car, then we go like, oh, it's just true. So basically we just have a whole bunch of truths in this conjunction, but true in a conjunction Okay, it's kind of like one in a multiplication. Okay, so let's just say that we, you're, you want to compute x times y, whatever x and y are, okay? And I say, uh, can, can we multiply the product of x and y by one? You go like, yeah, it doesn't really change the value, but why would you want to do that? That's because one is known as the identity of multiplication. How many people have heard about that word in mathematics. This particular value is an identity of this operator. Some of you have, okay, and some of you have not. So the idea of an identity is you can apply the operator with the identity relative to the operator as many times as you want, but it's not going to change the value of the expression. Multiplication by one means that you know, one is the identity of multiplication, plus zero is kind of the same deal. Zero is the identity of addition, okay? So those concepts may or may not be helpful in your, you know, other computer science classes, but if you're trying to get into uh, a program that has a math component in it, you know, understanding the concept of an identity is actually very useful. But we'll get to that also. We'll get to the concept of identity also and try to illustrate why it is important. But does everybody now understand why the implication is helping us to filter so that whatever the, 
the whatever is on the right hand side of the implication is only applied to things that are within the set in this case. Because if for everything that is not in the set, the implication is just true, but since we are making a conjunction of all of those true values, it doesn't matter. It doesn't impact the value of the conjunction whatsoever when we are talking about things that are not a part of this particular set. Is that okay? Yes? Okay, well, so let's, let's take a look at uh, an expansion of this entire thing. This is a partial expansion, but the full expansion is really large, but I can show you like one little part of it, okay? So let me see whether, okay, we can, we can do it, okay. So let's go ahead and do this, and I'll do the lazy thing. I will show you how to be lazy and be efficient at the same time. Right click, copy the clipboard text command. Switch to Joplin and just paste. Control V and, oh well, forgot to put the dollar signs you know, at the front and the, and the end, okay, but that's it. So if you want to learn how to use you know, this kind of, kind of you know, math type setting, you know, just right click on my stuff, get the format, paste it into Joplin and do whatever change you need to make. All right, so I'm gonna expand this one. And basically what we're trying to do is to expand this portion here. In other words, we're basically asking, you know, of everything in the enti entire universe, is that true or not? So, um, okay, I just have to copy this in, okay, yt equal to, and then paste uh, here, okay. So because we are basically binding variable E to everything in the entire universe, so I can bind it to anything I want. Now it's complaining it's not doing the rendering because of this space, by the way. So this E can be tax car, okay? So we'll just say tax car, okay? And it doesn't do it properly because um, I need to use math RM to contain text text car, there we go. Okay, it doesn't do the space thing either. Okay, I'm not, I cannot remember how to make it truly to make it a, a text. Okay, I, my car is an MX-5, okay, we'll just say MX-5, MX-5 then. Okay, so it, it becomes this and, okay, so we will put an and here. Um, give me something else in the entire universe. I think you guys, some of you know where I'm, wh where I'm going, right? So, uh, oh, okay, I will just go ahead and type it, okay, wedge, parentheses, and this time we'll deal with uh, a value like 2.5, okay? So 2.5 in the set 1, 2, 3, and then right arrow, which is implication, E is, oh, that thing, okay? 2.5 is less than 5, and obviously in this case, it is going to be MX5, you know, my car, math RM MX5 is less than 5, and, okay, this time we'll pick something that is actually in the set, let's say 2, okay, so we go like, oh, okay, sorry about that, so we'll say 2 is in the set of 1, 2, 3, and, oh, implies, sorry, implies, which is right arrow, um, two is less than five, and so on. Okay, so we'll just do a dots. There we go. All right. Let me just double check. Yep, so that looks right, okay? But it's hard, it's difficult to read now because what is happening is I'm looking at the original um, quantified expression, which is this part here. And I'm expanding it to say, oh, this E, the variable E, 
binds to everything in the entire universe. One at, one at a time, okay? But it will bind to everything in the universe. So that means my car, this classroom, the campus, okay, Mars, Venus, a satellite like Jupiter, and so on and so forth, right? So, so one of the many things in the entire universe is my car. So it will definitely evaluate, uh, you know, substitute my car in E and ask that question. And some of you go like, MX-5, which is a car, is less than five, doesn't even make sense. It doesn't have to, because we don't get to evaluate it. <laughs> Why don't we get to evaluate it? Because MX-5 is an element of one, two, three, it's false to begin with. Does that make sense? Is that right? Okay. So if the left-hand side of the implication is false to begin with, I don't bother with the right-hand side because if the left-hand side of the implication is false, the implication itself is true anyway. I don't have to bother to evaluate to the whatever is on the right-hand side. Is that okay? Which means this entire thing, okay, starting with this open paren and closing with this paren here is just true. Is that okay? So to understand why that is true, relies on your understanding of the implication operator and also your understanding of an element of the concept of an element in a set. Okay, so those are the key concepts to understand the, why the first sub-expression is false from here all the way to here. What about the second one? It's also stupid, it was true, okay? It was true, which is the identity of conjunction, like we spoke. So the second one is kind of the same here. 2.5 is an element of one, two, three, it's false. So because this is an empty implication, that means everything from here to here evaluates to true, okay? So now we have what? True and true, okay? And then we move on to this one, where you know we are looking at two as a value, two is an element of one, two, three, is true. Okay, this time I cannot shortcut the whole thing. This time I really have to look at whether two is less than five is true, which turns out that is the case. So now we have true and true and true, right? So basically, the dot, dot, dot here, the ellipses, is basically saying, yeah, we're just gonna repeat doing the same thing to everything in the entire universe. But now you already get a sense of if we are talking about something that is not in the set of one, two, three, it just evaluates to true. So that means the only thing that can make it false would be things in the set that we are concerned about, one, two, and three. And that's why, th this, is, this is why this is called a, a filtering mechanism, so that our attention is only on a particular set of items, not everything in the entire universe. Is that okay? All right, so to get this, okay, you know, I have to emphasize again, I know some of you are going like, oh, don't nag me again. But to understand this means you need to remember what is the element of, okay, which is this symbol here, and what is the implication operator, the truth table of the implication operator. All of those are prerequisite uh, concepts you know, that you need in order to understand the quantifier. Okay? So things do stack up in this class, okay? And they stack rather quickly too. So if that is the case, what about there exist? Okay? So in other words, you know, if I were to use this uh, example, but instead I want to use an existential quantifier as an example, what is that going to look like? How do we filter things? in an existential quantifier. So the way it works is like this. If you're only concerned about things in the set X in this case, for everything else it's like, I don't care about those, okay? The filtering mechanism in this case is not an implication, it is a conjunction. Why is that the case? Because when you're asking, is there at least one thing in the entire universe that can make P of E true, you are basically looking at a gigantic disjunction. It's an or thing, because you're, you're, you're asking, um, does Cat's car make P of E true, or 
that the classroom makes you an equal or the fun makes you an equal or two making you an equal and so on. They're all ordered together. So does that make sense? It does. Because if one thing is making you an equal, then the entire disjunction is true. So it has so that's why the existential quantifier is a gigantic disjunction. The universal quantifier is a gigantic conjunction. So what is the identity of this junction? In other words, we can say all this, all this, all this, all day long, it is not going to do anything. Zero, Zero or false, okay? So by making the filter, C has to be an element of X. That means for everything that is not an element of X, this part is going to be false. Well, since the element of X is a part of a conjunction, that means, oh, that means if something is not an element of X, the entire thing is going to be false, and then you know a false in a gigantic disjunction doesn't do a single thing. It doesn't make it. It doesn't change the value of the other part of the disjunction. Is that making any sense? Okay. So I do have an example here. Okay. So the example is actually using a shorter form, which is to say that for if there exists E in the set of one to three, E mod three is a zero. But functionally, what we are really asking is one mod two is a zero, or two mod three is a zero, or three mod two is a zero. Functionally, that is what is asked. Because for everything else, like tax star, the MX5, it's gonna say um, MX5 is an element of one, two, three, and MX5 mod 2 is a 0. MX5 mod 2 is a 0 does not even make sense. But MX5 is an element of the set 1, 2, 3, yes. And it gives you a value of false, which means I don't even have to bother to say, OK, what is the value of a MX5 mod 2? Because we don't get to that part. The first part of the conjunction is false to begin with. So we can short circuit the evaluation of the entire thing. So like we don't even bother to ask what is MX5 mod 2. Yep. So three remains of something that is not in the set that's evaluated to the identity yep. value, and it's only what's in the set is actually valid. Yep. And okay. therefore, the uni it, therefore the quantifier is filtering to only things that it that are of concern to you. For everything else, it's like okay, they don't they don't matter because they're not changing the value of the part that does matter. Because all all they're going to do is to return the identity of the respective operator of either the universal quantifier or the existential quantifier. So are we still doing okay so far with this discussion? Okay. Very good. So we got a bunch of uh, practice questions here too, which is also chat GPT generated. So is anyone interested in how I generate these questions so that you can do it on your own? Okay. It's actually pretty easy. I will show you actually live, you know, so it's going to be recorded and you guys can just replicate the process if that is what you're interested in. It is easy. Okay. You can time me how long it takes. So but the way you do it is you go all the way to the bottom and you click improve this page by contributing and edit. Now this part won't work unless you have an account with uh, GitHub, but assuming you have an account with GitHub, th this will work. So what you do is you copy, okay, so just you select and keep copying until you get to the actual question you know, section because you know, those are already generated by AI. So you want to exclude that. So we go all the way up to here. That's the actual text material that I have written. Control C, okay? So don't do Control A, Control C because we don't want to copy everything, just up to this part. Then you go to Chat GPT, Chat GPT, or your favorite LLM, you know, G, uh, Gen AI. And then the way you, you ask uh, Chat GPT is read the following content, okay? And you want to give it a description so that there's a context. So in this case, um, I would say that describes this 
subscribe and define quantifiers okay you can even make it more specific the universal and existential quantifiers I will be asking some questions after this okay or something to that effect okay and then you just paste control V paste the whole thing press the enter key <coughs> and then chat GPT is going to come back and say okay feel free to ask questions about this okay so now you can say um, give me you know, 20 hard questions based on this material now if you do something like this it's hard to say you know, in what form it's going to give you the questions so you, what you want to do is to say um, the present okay present the questions and answers using the HTML um, details and summary elements so I can check my own answers all right I think that's good enough press the enter key and it's going to give you HTML code so then at this point you just have to paste the HTML code into some kind of file and then you preview it do you want me to illustrate that step too no okay you guys know what to do with this okay all you have to do is to create a blank HTML document you can use notepad for that and then paste this content in you know they even give you a link here you don't even have to select and, and do the whole thing just click this right so now you go to um, you know I am a, I'm a command line kind of person so I'm gonna do everything on the command line right so now you go here and then I can say you know cat to um, whatever file name okay we'll just say questions okay questions HTML and I'll type in the H usual HTML head slash head I don't even care you know, I don't even bother to define the rest now I paste so control shift V will paste the actual content this is the end of the body which is then the end of the entire HTML document control D ends the entire document yes I did not even touch an editor you don't have to touch an editor to do this so now I go back to the browser and I just say okay go show me that file okay so you, you can use file colon slash 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 and then in Linux or yeah in Linux you know, this is how I designate the folder okay and what was the file name questions I think questions.html and it renders the whole thing yes it is kind of boring there, don't, there are no pictures and whatnot but you know you have all the questions what does the expression for all p for all xp of x mean how do you explain that in plain English it means every x in the entire universe makes p of x true or p of x is true for everything in the in entire universe okay all right let's pick another one just random one okay what is the logical equivalent of the expression there exists x such that not p of x is true so that means that it is not the case it is not the case that every x makes p of x true yep so we'll, we'll see right we'll, we'll click this yep it is not the case that every x makes p of x true so this is what you can do to kind of create some additional exercises for yourself just to practice is it helpful to you I'm not sure okay you know, because this I never had resources like this when I was in college that was a long time ago okay there was no internet okay when I was in college but this is now available to you and I think this is a good way to use your know, AI is to use it as a helping tool now what if the answer it gives you is not what you think it is conflicting with your answer and you have no idea which one is right. Are you right or is ChatGPT right? What do you do in that case? Yep, come ask me. OK, 
okay, you can either come ask me or you'll know, kind of have a small study group so that you guys can kind of at least talk about it first before coming to me and ask, okay, so who's right, chat GBT or us, okay? But so far, okay, at least with this class, with the, the material that we are talking about, chat GPT has been pretty good at this, which actually impressed me quite a bit. Because in two years of time, in uh, chat GPT 3.5, which is from two years ago, did not do as well when it comes to generating questions that has logic components in it. Now it's actually pretty good. It's actually impressive in some sense. Let me show you what I mean by impressive. Um, let's see. I think it's not in this module. It's, on, it's in the uh, even and odd one. I think that is. Okay, let me go find it. I think it has to do with the set notation one or the one set notation using quantifiers. I cannot remember which one. I'm guessing it's this one. So we go to these. Uh, nope, not this one. It's the other one there. Go to directory. Let's go back to basic set notations. It's the one that asks about odd numbers, the set of odd numbers. Infinite set. Okay, this one. Mm, yes. So this one impressed me. Because it's asking you, you know, with a, the in the, okay, this is actually, I'm testing whether you guys read the material or not, okay? In the material that I have written, that was an example to illustrate how do we express the set of all even numbers, okay? So if people are kind of frowning to me right now, I'll be concerned because that is they didn't read the material and not reading the text material for this class is not a, sustainable strategy for this class. I'm just pretty quietly like that. Okay, so this is kind of the mirror of that. You can, you know, it's actually pretty easy to work out. But when you, when I show the answer, I'll tell you why I think it is actually kind of impressive. Because I use uppercase E to represent the set of all even numbers because even starts with E. Chat GPT noticed the pattern of, oh, E is the first letter of even. So when we're dealing with the set of all odd numbers, I'm gonna use uppercase O. That actually impressed me because noticing patterns like that in the original text and be able to change some of it in order to reapply you know, the same concept, that is impressive from a machine you know, generated you know, question. Well, it impresses me, but it should scare you. Why do you think I say that? Yes, go ahead. Well, it's a bit of a question. Uh-huh. Uh, so if you have a timer, um, how do you think, you know, it's going to be between? Yeah, the, the comma is used a lot instead of the, uh, the red symbol for yeah. conjunction. So a lot of times your people use a comma instead of the red, but I use the red symbol. Okay, so, okay. so it's not different from the general knowledge that Chat GPT already has. So this part is not strictly coming from uh, the, the material that I have. But I, I mentioned earlier that this is impressing me, but it should scare you. Why do you think it should scare you? Potentially. Yep. Potentially, not you know, always. So you always have to sta stay ahead of the AI, right? You always have to look at what AI cannot do and make sure that you excel at that. And that's a moving target because what AI cannot do today is not what AI cannot do when you graduate. <laughs> so kind of keep that in mind. I don't want to depress you, but I do want to prepare you for that future. All right, so what are we going with all of this stuff here? So the next topic is also in, uh, uh, is already on ch uh, on the GitHub. So the, the way I do this is I just go to the directory and look for it, but it's everything is linked from um, Canvas already. So the next one is u utilizing quantifiers 
in order to explain uh, and define set operators. But before you be even get there, there's one additional module. It's called the big operators. Okay, so let's look for big. And we got five minutes. We can at least get started with this. Okay. So we're going to shift a little bit here from you know, all the set notation, quantifiers, and stuff like that to the sigma notation for summation. All of you, most of you, I hope all of you already know what the sigma notation means. It's, it's like, okay, we have a function to generate values, and then we have a bunch of values, a sequence of values, and we just want to add all of those values together. That's basically what the sigma notation is for. And I gave you an example here. Sigma, where i goes from 2 to 5, i squared is 2 squared plus 3 squared, blah, 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 all the way up to 5 squared. It's just an example. So the question is, can we, if, if somebody is new to this whole thing, but understands recursion otherwise, how do you define, how do you explain the sigma notation? So after all of these derivations, then I come to this conclusion here. I define you know, the sigma or the summation where i goes from b, which is the starting point, to e, which is the ending point, f of i, which is something that makes use of i to create a value. This whole thing is now a ternary expression. If b is greater than e, which means the beginning is already greater than the end, then it simply returns a zero. This is a ternary expression. Otherwise, we take b and go like, okay, let's figure out what is f of b. What about the rest? Well, the rest is going to be handled by a sub sigma notation where the beginning is excluding b itself. We start with whatever is after b. That is a recursive definition of sigma. So the question is, why do we want to do this? Why do we want to use a recursive definition where we can just say, oh, we are just summing this whole bunch of stuff from here to here? Because the other explanation, the latter, is ambiguous. This, there's no ambiguity in this definition here. The only trick to understanding this particular definition is the concept of recursion. Because I'm defining sigma using sigma. But this particular sigma doesn't have the same starting point. This starting point is one after the one that I have just taken care of. This is also the reason why CIFP 430 is a co-registered of this stuff, because a lot of algorithms we produce in CIFP 430 are recursive, because it is a way of looking at things. And when it, when it comes to data structure and algorithms of certain kinds, the recursive way of looking at things is actually easier to understand compared to the iterative way of looking at things. Everything that is recursive can be defined using iterations or loops, and vice versa. Everything that makes use of loop can also be recursive. There are certain programming languages, like common lists, that has no iteration construct whatsoever. If you need to do something like, oh, I need to do this like six times, you have to do recursion. That's the only way to do repetition, okay? So this is all kind of related. So the, the reason why I want you guys to kind of read this part here is it also defines what is the existential quantifier using a ternary expression and also the universal quantifier using um, an expression like this. The only thing <laughs> that is missing is what is B of X? If X is a set that is not empty, B of X just gives you one of the elements which one? We don't even care. Just give me n elements of x, and we're good. So I think you should have everything that you need to understand this particular definition, and these two definitions of um, existential and universal quantifier. And this also tells you the importance of understanding uh, the concept of identity. Because uh, the identity of disjunction is here. The identity of conjunction is here. The disjunction itself is here. The conjunction itself is here. So this actually shows you why 
the universal qualifier is related to a gigantic conjunction. It is also explaining why the implication operator can be used as a filtering mechanism. By the same token, it also explains why a why an existential qualifier is basically a gigantic disjunction, and the zero is the identity. So after this whole thing, you know, yeah, this can be a this can be a flaw. Okay, I admit this is a flaw, but I like to abstract things to no end. So here. I even say that this is just an operator. We don't even care or know what operator we are talking about. We just need to know, does it have an identity? And then we can just ident we can then define this whatever operator it is and just apply that using the same definition. Now, is that taking things a little bit too far? Probably for this class, okay? But it is not taking things too far from the perspective of if you are an efficient programmer, you notice patterns, and then you try to minimize copy and paste. This is how we use abstraction to minimize copying and pasting. This is the whole idea if you push it in a certain direction. This is the whole idea why we have object-oriented programming, why there's a superclass, why there are subclasses, why do we have templates, why do we have abstract classes in C++, why do we have interfaces in Java. All of those are abstraction mechanisms so that you can reuse code as much as possible. This is basically pushing in the same direction but in a mathematical sense. All right. Well, we are past the time of the end of this class, so I will see you guys next week. It is kind of odd that I see you once this week and I say, have a nice weekend again. I don't like that. I prefer to meet you guys Monday, Wednesday, Friday. They don't have that you know, class schedule anymore. All right, have a nice weekend. I'll see you guys on Monday. But, but try out the exercises at the end of the modules.